Hey, thank you very much. So this talk is going to be about openness, but as much as it's about openness, it's going to really be about choices or a choice that we have to make, I think, pretty soon. In our converging world, right, can convergence of um, IT, telecom, datacom, those are all converging together to do, solve new problems, do new things. There's a choice coming at us in terms of how we want what you might typically call the connect function. How do we really want that to operate in the future? And, and so this is also going to be a course to talk about the network. And I know when we talk about the network, sometimes I get some very interesting reactions, one of which kind of goes along the lines of, oh, Alexander, get off the stage. Okay? The network, are you serious? The network, the thing that's rigid, inflexible, static, it's in my way, guys. I mean, do something about that. Dude, the network's in my way. That's a great quote that I've heard. Well, if you bear with me, I think what we're going to tell you is there are some new tools coming. And the tools will allow us to have a kind of a cool conversation. These are cool tools that we're going to be talking about. And you think about what Sienna has been able to do. Right? Sienna came to market now almost 20 years ago. And the first product was around dense wavelength division multiplexing, right? Lots of capacity on fiber. But there were a couple of key principles we used when we built those products. And those principles have served us really well. Those two principles were open systems, right? We built the first products that would talk to anybody's other transport kit. It wasn't specific to one vendor's. Talk to anybody's, even some of the real old legacy stuff. Opened it up. The other thing we did is we used a lot of intelligence in the system. For its time, 20 years ago, it was actually a very intelligent system. You could talk up and down the line systems. You didn't have to run and adjust stuff. And that combination of openness and intelligence has served us really well because we've been able to grow our business. And now we're at the point, I mean, we light up about half the cell towers in North America. I mean, think about that, right? We're all the way out to the edge of the network. And openness and intelligence has now allowed us to get into a number of other businesses, connecting data centers, getting into partitioning data, getting things out onto the enterprise side. And we're privileged to now sell into a majority of large carriers worldwide, many of the large enterprises. Because openness, intelligence, smart networks, and all that have become more and more important to what, what people want to do. Now, in spite of everything we've done, all this intelligence that's out there, the capacity that's out there, uh, there's still a lot more to do. There's a lot of work that's left on the set here. And I want to take a moment and think about openness. And I want each of you to take, take a couple seconds. And if I said, we're going to go make the networks open up, we're going to open them up, we're going to build open networks today, what would that mean to you? And I bet you every person in here would come up with a slightly different definition of what an open network means. Well, let me give you a sense of what it means to me. When I think of an open network, I think of a network there are no fences. So what's a fence in a network? Well, those are boundaries. Right? There's a lot of artificial boundaries in networks, some of it historic to the way things grew up. Regulatory issues, boundary lines that were created, inner exchange versus metro versus long haul versus inner city versus back haul. Lots of labels and all these sorts of things. Well, a lot of that can go away now. No one-way signs. Well, what's a one-way sign in the network? Well, we've all experienced where well, I need it over here, well, but the network's over here. No, I want it over here, no, the network's over here. That needs to stop. The network, how it connects, the capacity that's available needs to become much more flexible, much more dynamic, much more real time. Third one I put up here is no speed limits. Now, clearly, you know, we've got laws of physics we've got to obey and the rest of it, but I can't tell you how many times I've sat in the audience of a technical presentation and listened, sometimes it's our competitors sitting there going, we have analyzed your problem, Mr. Customer, We've looked at all your field sites, all your applications, and we've worked out what you need is 28.25 megabits per second to all your field sites. And I'm here to tell you, they just don't get it. That's the wrong answer, because they're chopping off the future when they start to think that way. So we need to be thinking differently about what openness means. And I'll give you a simple example of what something we can't do, but we should be able to do. I can go online, any of you can pretty much go online, and you can order up pretty much as much compute 
and as much store as you want, right? In the grand scheme of things, there's a connect function, a compute function, and a storage function. Well, compute and store, you can get online. Get a credit card, go online, order it up. You've got your how many servers you need, how, many store, how much storage you need. Try to get a network that does that as flexibly. You can't. Most cases, you can't. So there's an existence proof that says we know it's not flexible enough, so let's talk about how we can get it to be far more flexible, far more dynamic. I would claim it's time for Connect to step up to what store and compute can do, right? Connect, compute, and store coming together, build a better machine. That's, that's what we're really after. And if you think about what does it take, right? What would it really take to create the truly on-demand user experience? We've all talked about in the past bandwidth on-demand, but it's bandwidth, it's connectivity, it's applications, it's capabilities on-demand, right? That's what you're really after. So let's go through what that would be. Start with what's most critical. What does everyone, call, what does everyone care about? What I care about, what do you care about? We care about the applications. The applications really are the instantiation of what's mission critical. You want to be able to run applications, right? That's what you're doing as a business. Well, applications kind of inherently have to run on something. The ones that I've shown up here, very interesting common denominator, what is it? It's a network, right? We're the most networked we've ever been, right? The network delivers all this kind of connectivity, and you can make a very simple argument that today, networking, connecting, the quantity and quality of that connection, that bandwidth that you get, determines end user experience like it never has and ever before. Right? It's more important what networking does today and this choice we're gonna have about how open we want it to be than it's ever been, because it can truly revolutionize what goes on. So these applications sit on top of an infrastructure, and when we think about this problem, what we're gonna say is that infrastructure really needs to be thought of as a platform. But you could argue it's a programmable platform infrastructure. Now, why do you use the word platform in this thing? Well, platforms are inherently things you build other things on top of. In fact, today, if you can get the right mix of connect, compute, and store, you can build an entire business on top of a programmable platform. Witness the rise of things like Netflix and Hulu, Dropbox. Okay? Those are all applications that live on top of effectively a programmable platform infrastructure. Okay. Now that platform infrastructure has to have those three components. And Connect needs to step up. It needs to be just as flexible, just as programmable, just as virtualizable as what we've come to get very comfortable with in the compute and store environment. But to do that, we're gonna need to change the way we think about the network just architecturally. The way that we have historically built networks, which to a great extent is I'm gonna get a bunch of boxes, I'm gonna bolt them all together, and there's my network. If that needs to continue to scale like that, we're gonna run out of a lot of things. We're gonna run out of space, we're gonna run out of power, we're gonna run out of cooling. We can't continue to build networks by just bolting a bunch of the boxes together. That's just not gonna scale. And a lot of what you heard about earlier today, and you're gonna hear about all this week, is scale, because massive scale is gonna be required here. So just a whole new way of architecting networks is gonna be required. So when we think about that, what, what has to happen? Well, we think three things have to happen. You gotta go after scale, you have to go after programmability, and you gotta go over network level apps. How do we go after scale? Bigger. Converge packet optical, we'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But think about convergence. One box does the work of multiple boxes. We have to go after programmability. We have to make this thing dynamic, real-time, programmable, software-defined. It's gonna be critical. And we've gotta get it so it's application-friendly. We have to give it the ability to have network-level apps as well, truly make it open. And that's really one of the most critical decisions in front of us, is how open do we make this? Do we allow ourselves to have network-level applications or not? But if we do, if we can solve these three, then I claim we can get to this performance on demand environment that we really need and I would even argue deserve because we're after that connect, compute, and store the better machine. So let's talk a little bit more detail about these. With regards to scale, there's always just the capacity of scale. 
right? Just how fast can you go? How many bits can you stick down the pipe? Well, in the last couple of years, with the advent of coherent optics, and we were the first champions of that in the industry, move to coherent optics, we're using one laser to measure another, receiver laser, transmitter laser, mix them together, you can measure frequency, phase, polarization, lots of information. All of a sudden, you solve all those propagation equations in a digital signal processor, and you rip all that complexity out of the fiber lines. So in two years' time, look at what's been achieved. 40 gigabits, 100 gigabits, 200 gigabits, 400 gigabits, 800 gigabits. That's the kind of capacities you can talk about per channel now, right? That's huge amounts of capacity. So we've cracked the code on how to go fast. You know, sure, there's you know, physical limits. We want to stay on the right side of the laws of physics, but we can go real fast. The other key piece to this is convergence. This is one box does the work of multiple boxes. You, know, you don't build infrastructure anymore where you lay down a fundamental, let's say in the old world, it used to be Sonnet SDH, and you drop a bunch of packet boxes on top of it and start to call it a network. You now have the ability to have truly converged infrastructure network elements. Was well, a packet box is now a packet blade. And this is not the God box. Okay, we've tried God boxes in the past. Lots of companies were created and died trying to build up the God box where you shoehorn everything into one network element. Right? There are real good reasons why your car doesn't float and doesn't fly. Okay? You tend to build things for specific reasons, but you need a technology base that allows it. Well, in the case of converged packet optical, we now have that. And it's one that most people are familiar with. It's called Ethernet. I mean, Ethernet has done some things in its history that no other technology has accomplished. Very simple existence proof, right? You travel the world, you need power adapters to go around. That RJ45, that Ethernet connection is the same everywhere. That drives just a unique set of economics that's compelling, right? I can plug in in London when I was there last week, plug in here, going to be in Rio in a couple of weeks, plug in there. It's all the same. Drives just compelling economics. So it's ubiquitous, it's affordable, it's driving Ethernet cost curves, it's wonderful. From a technology point of view, though, it had a really interesting set of features, just little orange boxes on there, layer one, layer two. It's the first truly converged technology we've ever had in the infrastructure business. The fact that I can take one network element and have it serve both layer one and layer two functions. And look, over major distances, level L1 functions, you need a little bit of help. You can wrap it with OTN. You put forward error correction. All that exists. But fundamentally, it's Ethernet. So that drives a unique capability architecturally. I've never been able to build an infrastructure that was also a service as soon as it was built. In the past, they always had to lay down some kind of a foundation and then put a whole bunch of boxes around it to actually make it something you could use. I don't have to do that anymore. I can build the infrastructure, and it's immediately a service. If I pull an OC192 into this room, most people wouldn't know what to do with it. I can pull a giggy, everybody knows what to do. In fact, your kids know what to do. That's the compelling reason. Second piece of this, we have to change network behavior with SDN. And there I've said it, software-defined networking. I think it's going to be a tremendous tool of how we want to change how networks get built. What we've done here is captured at the bottom a pretty simple architectural view of how we think networks are going to be built in the future. Left-hand side going over, we're going to connect users to content. Another portion of the network is going to connect content to content. Why do we call them content centers? Why not data centers? Why not central offices? Because, well, look, the central office of the future is going to look a lot like a data center, but it's going to have other things in it. It's going to have a lot of things that used to be contained in the network. It's going to have virtualized machines that take the place of all these bolt-on boxes. That's going to be a key piece to it. How do you talk to it? You need well-defined APIs. OpenFlow is an example. OpenFlow is a wonderful start. OpenFlow needs to be extended in a couple ways, expanded down to lower layers, because to really know what's going on in your network, you need to know everything all the way down to the physical layer, and it's going to be extended up, touch into some of the application space. But it's a wonderful start. Another piece, when we think of SDN at Siena, it's the combination of that well-defined interface at the equipment level up through these network level applications. That's what we think of as SDN. And then beyond that, we have our own construct that we call OPN. Now, it actually acronyms when you say it to open. So guess which way we're betting, right? We're betting on the openness piece. But what OPN stands for 
The reason we chose it, sounds open. It's also optical packet to great scale. That's why it's got that exponent. And it's also open and programmable, again, to great scale. That's where we're after, right? Optical packet to great scale, open and programmable to great scale. And with this kind of an architectural construct, let's talk for a minute about how the network should behave. Okay, I'm purposely staying away from the acronym soup we could throw at this thing. I want you to think about how this kind of network should behave when it is the programmable platform or a piece of the connect, compute, and store paradigm. So at the top layer, what should I be able to do? I say, OK, at APIN, at the network level, maybe we should even call it a network programming interface, but for here, we'll call it API for the network. Look, I want to move 100 gigabytes from A, you know, a to C, and it's from me. The reason I capitalize the me, because SDN and some of those principles have some very interesting, um, as yet undelivered, but very interesting security constructs, because you're writing the forwarding table into the network. You get to control exactly what happens. You're not being subject to all sorts of protocols and algorithms that are running that you don't quite know what's going on. Here, you're telling the network what to do. While that flows down through network application level, and that, again, explodes outward into a series of commands that say things like, come into the network port A, come out on port C, I'm going to give you diverse routing, here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to report back when I'm done. Okay, think about that in terms of a programmable platform. It's a whole different way of thinking about the network. But this is where we believe things have got to go to. Now, what do we do with this going forward? Here's a simple example. This is one that we've shown off a number of times. Um, we set up what effectively is a beautifully crafted IP infrastructure. We sit there, it is traffic engineered, it's load balanced, it might be WAN accelerated, all that's weren't running, all the users are happy, it's great. And we go in and we drop, in a couple of examples, okay, here comes a 4K video stream, high def video stream, what do we do? Okay, in most cases, what will happen is everyone suffers. The network just overloads, because what you're trying to do is apply fine-grained packet processing to every flow in the network everywhere. We know that doesn't scale well. So let's make the network respond better. Let's have it identify the fact that, oh, I've got a big flow. It's overwhelming what else is going on. And let's apply different technologies and move it up and down the stack. So maybe I want to carry it at a lower layer in the network where it's very efficient to carry large flows. That's exactly what you do. You let the flow move down in the network, and you bypass a lot of the high touch points. Now all of a sudden, wow, I got a 4K video signal flowing, and everybody else stays happy. Right? It's just a whole different way of having the network respond to your traffic flows as they come on and off, because it can map the traffic to the technology in the network that's best suited to carry that kind of traffic. Right? It's more of a dynamic environment. So you play this forward, what would this start to look like? Um, at the edge of the network, I better have some, you know, simple SDN controlled elements. I mean, that's where I'm ingressing, egressing out of the network. I better have those things. And if you remember those principles we talked about earlier, well, the reason now that these kind of principles, openness, intelligence, programmability, those are starting to show up at cell towers. And why you can now start to find Sienna boxes on desktops and down in wiring closets is because this is the kind of feature functionality we're starting to enable. Right? It's time to start putting in place the foundation for this programmable network, this programmable platform infrastructure that we know we're going to want in the future, because that's what's going to enable all these new applications and all these new services. And this is the way you go about it. Now, I want to give you a simple construct. Right? If this thing was my smartphone, and I found myself needing, hey, I need a stopwatch, I don't go buy a stopwatch. What I do is I drop a stopwatch application on my smartphone, and now I've got a stopwatch. We want the network to basically work the same way. We've done here, we've captured, here's your iPad. It's got a representation of your network sitting at the bottom, and there's a series of applications that you can run on it. A bunch of different types, recovery, provisioning, partitioning, all sorts of different applications that you can run on your network. So let's give you a couple of examples of this. Here's one where we've partitioned the network. Now, why would you want to partition the network? Well, you might be running end of month close. You might be carrying the World Cup. You might be carrying Super Bowl. And you want pieces of your network that are partitioned off on different 
technology vectors, whether it's on an ethernet vector, a wavelength color vector, a fiber vector, whatever, we want to be able to partition that portion of the network off and just segment it. Well, but again, under software control. Okay? Another one, very simple example, migration of things. I might have virtual machines I want to move around. I might have data sets that I want to move around. I'm sitting and just running in two completely different states. I have one state of the network and my infrastructure, which is there during the day. I mean, me running 100 gigabit ethernet between a couple of locations. And at night, I want to be able to reprogram that network. Maybe I'm doing synchronous backup. Maybe I've got some fiber channel running. And the network just changes state. Right? It isn't people going down and pulling fibers and fingering the network and all that other craziness. Right? It's a straightforward kind of a provisioning software application drop on the network. Here's the connections I want. Here's the services I want. Here's when I need it. Press a button, and off you go. Right? That's really the way we believe the network has to operate in the future and arguably should operate in the future. So it's early days in a lot of this, right? But when we look at the benefits of openness, what openness has done when we brought it into the compute industry, when we brought it into the storage industry, it is time for openness, open principles, the principles of intelligent networking programmability to show up in the connect industry, in the networking space. The changes that this brings are for the better. Okay, this is all about taking back control in a lot of ways. Go back to my comment earlier around the network's in the way. Well, let's get it out of the way. Let's move it aside and make it flexible, make it dynamic, make it programmable. Let's be able to drop applications on it and do new things that we haven't thought of yet. It's all about, in some cases, driving faster innovation. We've seen the pace of innovation pick up every time we have opened up a technology base like this. And I'm sure we can see it open up again as we open up the connect function. Now, I won't say that this is all green lights. There are clearly some examples of some warning signs. There are folks out there who are going to be very loud about, well, this is too bit disruptive. There's too much inertia. We can't change. I'm going to tell you, we have to change. There's going to be a few folks who will say, we're open, but really aren't. Right? They're open, but proprietary. That's typical. But I think if we can get past those, if we can get past those kind of warning signs, no roadblocks yet, just warning signs, get the network to be the open platform. And it's going to take an ecosystem. There is no one company that can give you connect, compute, and store. Here it is, buy it, you're done. Right? It's an ecosystem issue. Then actually, all this hype around SDN, and I'll admit, SDN is wildly hyped right now. But I think it actually could be under hyped. I can think it can be the most transformative thing we've come across in a couple of decades. Maybe in 10 or 15 years, we're going to look back and say, how did we ever build networks any other way than as these programmable platforms. Okay, so with that, I thank you. Um, I want to invite you all to come to the open road, as it were, O-P-E-N, as well as O-P to the power of N, optical packet to great scale, and open and programmable to great scale. Thank you very much. Have a great show.